Well, I'll tell you what, guys, if our brackets are bad, what about other people? Because as I said, this show, we we projected, I think we had everybody but Oakland. I mean, I think we got the vast majority on last week's show. So um, I will say this. What excites me most about this bracket is you got the Cinderella's, but now you got the big name schools. I like it when Cinderella wins one game. Here's a look at the Sweet 16, and you see you've got a lot of big-name programs in there. There aren't a whole lot of Cinderella's left, even though we got some fireworks, but you get a look at it there. The 16 teams remaining in the region, and we're going to start by breaking down – 16 teams remaining in the bracket. We're going to start by breaking down the East region. I'm going to start with that top seed. Isaac, I'm going to go to you first. Guys, we're just going to go through those eight different games. We're going to see how we uh, how we each feel about it. Isaac, the first one, UConn versus San Diego State. Tell me who you like and tell me why. Yeah, I'm back on the UConn train, right? It's really tough to back the best team in the country, right? What a tough cross that I have to carry today because this is one of the best teams in college basketball. And I think they're playing at a really, really elite level. And the, the big matchup here, right, is Jaden Ledee against Donovan Klingon. And what Klingon's impact was against Northwestern, just his – I mean, he's just a monster. And you can't really prepare for him. I think he's healthy. I think he's playing the best basketball his career. But I think you're catching San Diego State at a tough time if you're UConn because this is an Aztec team that really struggled to shoot the ball from three they've really struggled honestly since February 1st until the last game where they're able to get past into the sweet 16 where they were able to really knock down shots from downtown if that sticks I think this is a different game but just the blend of what UConn does so well with clinging at the back line that I think will hamper Ladie a little bit give me the Huskies Jaden Ladie Chris is is in my opinion one of the most improved players in the country he was really a role player last year on this San Diego State team that uh, went all the way to the finals before losing to UConn. He averaged under eight points per game. This year, he's over 21 along with eight boards. He's extended his shooting range. He's making mid-range shots at a high clip. He's also making about a three every other game after going four years in college basketball without making a singular one. I'm not sure if that's enough for San Diego, but who do you like on Thursday? You know, uh, let me just say this and preface it by saying I'm from Houston where Jaden's from. I know his family very well. And I know you guys are going to do a portal uh, uh, segment later. This is a product of the portal working the right way, being patient, waiting for your opportunity. He played in the national championship game off the bench behind Nathan, uh, behind Nathan Minton. And look what's happening this year for him. Let, let me just say this. If for anybody to beat UConn, you're going to have to have the game of your life. Again, they're not the most invincible team. And I've seen invincible teams, you know, UNLV, before they lost to Duke the next year in the Final Four. You know, Georgetown, people thought was invincible. Uh, and, and so at the end of the day, this is not invincible. Can they repeat? Yes. For San Diego State to have a chance, right? They're going to have to make threes. I hate to dumb it down to that, but you have to get ahead of them and force them to come from behind. It's not going to be on Jalen D. Jalen D is not going to get 30 and San Diego State wins. It's going to have to be the others. Reese Waters, all those guys, Tramel. Butler, they're going to have to have the game of their lives if these guys are going to have an opportunity to win. They're going to have to rebound the basketball. And and the UConn has so many weapons. So you're going to have to have a game where Cam Spencer doesn't – he doesn't have it that game. Or, you know, or Tristia Newton struggles and turns the ball over too much. But Danny's not going to let these guys play overconfident. And I love Donovan Klingon, but at the end of the day, and I know he had a great game blocking shots. He played great as a goalie. But Brian Dutcher, let's not underrate him as a coach. And forget about what happened in the Mountain West. The uh, the Aztecs struggled a little bit down the stretch in the Mountain West, but they are clearly still the best team in that league and a team that has the best chance because they can pitch a shutout. They play defense well. And the committee, right, storylines, narratives, they got what they wanted. They got the two teams that played in the national championship. TV is happy right now. All right, so speaking of committee and the TV uh, there's a little back and forth between the coaches. Uh, it was uh, it was with Matt Norlander that Danny Hurley found out that they were the early game on Thursday. You would have thought that they would have played Friday after playing Sunday. And he said that's just adding to the uh, us versus the world mentality. He said the committee was, looked and I'm paraphrasing, seemed like they were a little out to get him with Auburn, Iowa State, Illinois. Uh, then San Diego State comes back and says, well, we're playing in the Connecticut Open anyway, going out to, bo- going out to play in Boston. So... Uh, There are some storylines with these two head coaches. It should make for plenty of theatrics in this rematch of last year's championship game. For the record, I will stay with the Huskies as well. 
All right. Also in the East region, we're going to go down and it's a two versus three Iowa State versus Illinois. Chris, I'm going to start with you on this one because I think this is one of the more intriguing games that we're going to see in the Sweet 16. Who do you like in this matchup? Uh, you use the word intriguing. I use the word exciting. You know, you talk about, you know, a clash of two different styles of play and styles make fights. Iowa State with that vice grip defense. I mean, they put you in that cyclone, no pun intended, and it is hard to get out or escape it. T.J. Oxelberger, I mean, Iowa State is not the sexiest place in America, and he's done a great job. They finished second in the Big Big 12. They won the Big 12, Big 12 tournament. Taven Lipsy is unbelievable, and they just find ways to win. They, I'm telling you, they don't have great talent. You know, you got, you know, Hassan Ward inside. They got Keisha Grip. They, they have a collective team, but T.J., this is where – Coaching matters, and they have a style, and and they don't uh, deviate from it. But listen, they're getting ready to play a juggernaut offensively in Illinois. I mean, Terrence Shannon Jr. has been phenomenal. Marcus DeMoss, the transfer again. We're talking about transfers. How did it's, it, it amazes me that Lance Jones, Marcus DeMoss, came from Southern Illinois, and Southern Illinois didn't go to the tournament. This kid has been phenomenal. He had a triple double. He is great. Coleman Hawkins, very underrated big, very versatile. They're just really, really good. And Brad Underwood is one of his best coaching jobs. They score, score, score. The question is, as I say, clash of styles. Can Illinois, they've been scoring 80 plus. Now they have been down for the last five games that they played. They were down double digits in the Big Ten all three games. They were double did they were down to start their first game off in the end of the turn. They blew the doors off of Duquesne. The question is if they get down to a very good team in Iowa State who beat up on Houston, Isaac, will these guys have the, you know, the the energy, the 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 fight, the stick to come back against a team like Iowa State, who is a winning program and very adept at beating really good programs. This is going to be a very good game. Yeah, this so, is a high level game, high level. And the thing that's funny about it is that Iowa State's defense, they're so good at limiting shots at the rim. Illinois gets to the rim a ton. Illinois' defense struggles guarding the rim, but Iowa State doesn't get there a ton, one of the lowest rim rates in all college basketball. So it's just very back and forth. I think Illinois, though, has a different gear that it can get to because I think they're the more talented team. Just pound for pound, Terrence Chan is the best player on the floor. And I think Marcus Damask is probably the second best player on the floor. And if Illinois doesn't really go to many ball screens, that's actually a good thing, I think, in this matchup because Iowa State's defense is so terrific at blitzing ball screens and turning over. That's not really Illinois' MO. They're matchup hunters. They're one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, my six foot six, 205 pound All-American guard is better than your six foot two guard. That's how there is, that's how their game plan is. And so I think with Illinois, they have a little bit more answers to the test in this matchup. Hey, if, if we're struggling offensively, we'll go big and we'll bring Dane Danger in the, uh, into the game. But the thing how Iowa State beats Illinois is with the little plays. It's the offensive rebounding. That's been a struggle for Illinois at times this year. It's turn those turnovers that you can get into layups, those pick sixes. That's the way that I think Iowa State has to stick in this one because I don't think Iowa State has a gear that they can get to where they can get 80 and beat them. You have to keep Illinois in that low 70s. You cannot let Illinois get to 80. If Illinois gets to 80, I'm not sure Iowa State can get there. But if they're in the low 70s, Iowa State has a chance. And it comes with all those dirty plays. Like you just have to be so good in those intangibles, those after timeout plays, those baseline out of bounds plays, what you're doing on the glass, second chance opportunities. It's all that little stuff that I think is going to really matter and swing the table in this one. So, guys, I want to share one thought and then get you, get a final prediction from both of you. At the beginning of this season, Brad Underwood said, everybody is concerned about our point guard play except for me. They really didn't have a prototypical point guard in the lineup. They are now playing an Iowa State team that has the best defense in the country in large part because they force so many turnovers. This is the ultimate test of Illinois' ability to take care of the ball and operate without a prototypical point guard. We are really going to find out if this roster construction works for the biggest moments, because if they can get past Iowa State playing with this type of lineup without a traditional point guard, I think the answer is they can get past just about anybody. So final answer on the clock. Chris, who are you taking? Uh, I'm taking Illinois. I want to see that Illinois-UConn matchup in the Elite Eight. All right, Isaac, who you got? Illinois. Marcus Damask has been a pretty darn good point guard for them. Triple-double, then seven dimes in the second round win, too. So yeah, nice little point guard addition that they've got there out of the portal. Yeah, nothing little about him, though. He's six foot six. All right, I'm going to uh, just for argument's sake, I'll go Iowa State. I was going to pick Illinois. I, you know what? No, I'm sticking with what I was going to say. We're all going <laughs> Illinois. I think uh, the talent is too much at the end of the day.